What's up everybody, Darius Daniels, and don't fast forward this part. I know some of you don't do it. Hold up a second. You're about to watch a message that I wanna make sure I give you context for because the message is going to be controversial. This is a message in a series I taught called I Quit Church. I taught this series at all of our campuses, our two campuses in New Jersey, our extension site in Los Angeles, and I taught it every Saturday at 5.30 p.m. for a month in Orlando. We've got a campus in Orlando, Florida. I speak live there in person every Saturday at 5.30 p.m. The address is on the screen. Um, and I'm in New Jersey live every Sunday at four services at two of our campuses there. But listen, I did this series called I Quit Church to help those that may have given up on church and also to help those who are in church have a greater understanding of those who may have given up on church and i wanted to give some insight as to why they may have given up on church you know you can't assist people without empathy it's incredibly important to get into their world and to get an understanding. I believe you can't assist people you're insulting. And if we want those who have fallen away from church to get reconnected back to church, one of the things that we gotta do is to understand them, listen, learn, and also examine ourselves as a church and be willing to address what needs to be addressed so church can be a safe place for all people. Because some of you may not know this, some of you may not agree, but all churches aren't as safe as they should be. All right, so with that in mind, I want you to be blessed, be encouraged, enjoy this message, take care. And uh, Matthew chapter 21, verse number 12 says, Jesus entered the temple and he drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of money changers. Let's not sanitize the story. He tore the club up. <laughs> Overturned the tables of money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. And verse 14 says, the blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. This is the reading of God's word, grateful for the gift of the scriptures to our life. I want to use the series topic as a sermon topic today. I want to talk from the subject, I quit church. Family, I want to interrupt our regularly scheduled worship gathering with this breaking news announcement. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but people are quitting church. I say this not just experientially as a faith leader, I say this statistically, the numbers corroborate my claim at an alarming rate. People are engaging in a mass exodus from organized religion. According to the Gallup group, um, in 1999, 70% of Americans claimed church membership. Now, less than 50% do. And out of the 50% that claim church membership, listen to this, the average attendee attends one to two times a month. Most mainline denominations are experiencing declines, number one, in the people attending their churches, and they're experiencing increases of churches actually closing their doors. 
And these trends are seen across theological and ethnic barriers. They move out of just the Protestant circle, even in high church traditions like the Catholic Church. We are seeing similar trends. 20 years ago, close to 76% of Catholics belong to a church. Now, less than 60% do. These trends are also manifesting themselves generationally. 62% of Generation X attended church, while only 42% of millennials do. And I think it is imperative, it is important, ladies and gentlemen, if we love the church the way we say we love the church, and if we love people the way we say we love people, we should pause for the cause and ask ourselves why are so many people quitting church? There are a myriad of potential reasons we've got the rising of secularism, we've got the uh, access to the internet, the internet causing a new kind of enlightenment in affecting society the way the printing press did. We've got access to virtual worship services where people can worship virtually and they don't have to go to a physical location. And yes, all of those are contributing reasons to why people may be quitting church, but I think it's important for the church to put a mirror up to its face and ask itself, are we one of the reasons? I believe it's imperative to ask that question because anyone that wants to improve anything must be willing to assess it. If you want to improve a relationship, you must be willing to assess it. If you want to improve a business, you must be willing to assess it. Even athletes know if they want to improve their skill, they must be willing to watch game film to see what they can improve. You don't try to improve something because you hate yourself. You try to improve something because you love yourself. And we don't want to improve church because we hate the church. We want to improve church because we love the church, but you can't cannot fix what you will not face and I have a question I think we need to explore are we a part of the reason people are quitting church <laughs> as we attempt to explore this issue ladies and gentlemen I, I want to contend that all church quitting isn't created equal All quitters aren't the same. And for the purpose of this preaching presentation, I want to divide us, us uh, I want to divide people into two groups. The first group is group one. And this group has quit church without accurately assessing why. They have a proclaimed reason that they quit church, but they are unaware of the actual reason that they have quit church. And with this particular group, whenever there is any kind of institutional issue or moral issue with spiritual leaders or spiritual institutions, then they'll say things like, that's why I don't go to church. When the truth of the matter is, you wouldn't go if that didn't happen. <laughs> These are people who, like Adam in the Garden of Eden, are blaming something else for what they're actually responsible for. The woman you gave me. So these are people who don't have the self-awareness to dig deep enough to be honest with themselves about the real reason that they are no longer affiliated, associated with church as we know it. And, and this group, ladies and gentlemen, can be characterized by a few traits I want to lift up to you today. Number one, this is a group that has spiritualized their selfishness. Church wasn't what they wanted it to be, so they thought it wasn't 
what it was supposed to be. <laughs> church wasn't something that they expected, so they assumed it wasn't something God intended. They assumed if they didn't like it, God didn't either. And when someone spiritualizes their selfishness, they make themselves a victim when they aren't. Because they feel entitled to have their preferences accommodated when God promises only to meet our needs. Another trait, are y'all with me? Another trait is some people have quit in this group because this group won, because they've operated with inaccurate information. This means that they have been taught things inaccurately. In academic theological circles, we say you can't have orthopraxis without orthodoxy, that you can't have right practice without right doctrine, that you can't live a good life with bad information. And some people have quit because they are frustrated because they received information that was inaccurate, but they received it from sources that they trusted. And sincerity is not the only prerequisite for right doctrine. Paul told Timothy, study to show yourself approved, a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So if I can divide the word rightly, it means it's possible to divide it wrongly. Notice Paul did not tell Timothy, pray to show yourself approved. He said, study. Because prayer is not a substitute for study. He says you need to worship with your mind to make sure you are accurately understanding the scriptures that you are presenting to people. And some of us received information from people that were sincere. It's not their fault, but they were not giving the tools that they needed to properly understand the scriptures they were quoting to you. See, just because they were able to quote the scriptures doesn't mean they understood what the scriptures meant. Oh my. Are you following me? So Paul told Timothy, study. He said you need to study because people have the expectation that you have a degree of expertise in this area to offer them some insight that's relevant to their life. Now all of us in this room study a number of different things. Some of us in this room, we study some things with medicine. But when we go to a medical professional, we expect that professional to have a degree of expertise that we do not have because this is what you do. You trust that they have studied so much that we go to a medical professional who often gives us a diagnosis we can't pronounce or understand. Writes a prescription you can't even read. That you take to a pharmacist you don't even know. And trusting that they're putting in the bottle what's supposed to be in the bottle and we pay money and put it in our mouth because we trust that you have done your research and that you have studied and when people come to church and they need to get spiritually well they need to know that the person that is giving them their spiritual prescription is somebody that has done more than said a prayer on the way to church I need to know that you love me enough to take my issue seriously and to teach me. I need to know more than ain't he all right. I know he's all right, but I'm trying to raise kids and I'm trying to make decisions and I'm trying to handle stress and I'm trying to make career choices. I'm not all right. I know he's all right. I'm not all right, so I need you to give me something that's going to help me be all right. And some of us meant well, 
but we got information who quoted from people who quoted scriptures. They meant well, but they didn't understand them. And bad doctrine is not neutral. Did you hear me? Bad doctrine is not neutral. It hurts. It harms. It injures. And so some of us, uh uh-oh, y'all all all right? Y'all tighter than the other services. This... (laughs) And this is the young crowd. This is, it's only getting worse. I'm just, it's only getting worse. So, so some of us, some of us heard, oh my. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we heard, heard things like, woman, you shouldn't wear pants. All right. Y'all got me over here? Because the Bible says, a woman shall not wear anything that pertains to a man. I said, okay, cool. During the time that was written, what did men wear? Jesus didn't have true religion. Jesus didn't have Levi's. So if they didn't wear pants, what makes you associate that scripture with a woman wearing pants? Just because they quoted it doesn't mean they understood it. So you got little girls, I'm sorry, playing kickball in blue jean skirts. Some of them coming to a church like this having to detox and feeling guilt and shame because your conscience responds to the information it's been fed. So if you've been fed that this is wrong, then that wrong knowledge makes you feel wrong about something that's right. And it's only when your knowledge gets reformed that the conscience can be corrected. There are some people who've left the faith because they believe the faith is a faith that doesn't make room for their race. Oh, I told you, we, it's all again worse. Christianity is multi-ethnic in its origin. Every shade, every color has a part of the Christian story. But some people have left the faith because they erroneously assume they got inaccurate inaccurate information that Christianity is slave religion. I don't hear you talking back to me. Yeah, they leave the faith because somebody told them this is the white man's religion. They gave that to you when you were a slave to control you. My Bible tells me that even in the Old Testament, 1 Kings chapter 10, that a woman from Africa named Sheba came to Jerusalem to see a man named Solomon. And some historians suggest that she was responsible for taking expressions of Judaism all the way back to Africa. My Bible tells me that there were people in the Bible who were called Cushites. Cush means burnt. Dark skin. My Bible tells me that Miriam and Aaron got mad at um, Moses because Moses married a woman of color. So if Moses married a woman of color, what kind of babies did they produce? My Bible tells me in the book of Acts that there was an accountant for Queen Candace from Africa who was leaving one of the Jewish feasts, who was reading Isaiah and did not understand it. And he ran into a man named Philip who explained the scriptures to him. He gave his heart to Jesus and got baptized, took that faith back to Africa. My Bible tells me a man of color helped Jesus carry the cross. (laughs) 
So when people tell you, you're bamboozled, you need to look back at them and say, you're bamboozled. There's a place for me in this story. Jesus was in our story long before slave ships. Jesus was in our story long before America. Jesus was in our story. With the Bible says that the, the, the Bible says every nation, every tribe, every tongue, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Saint Augustine of Hippo was from North Africa, a man of color. Anthanasius, a church father, was called the black dwarf, a man of color. Tertullian, the man who coined the term Trinity, was a dark-skinned man. What do you mean? I have no place in this story. This is my religion too. Some people quit. You, they got inaccurate information. Let me tell you how, how, some, how uninformed some people are. There are some people that hate Jews and call themselves a Christian. Now they got a cross on their on they little stuff. Hoods. Cross on their hoods. Y'all not, y'all not, y'all thought I was playing this month. And talking about you hate Jews. Jesus is a Jew. Jesus is a Jew. Inaccurate information. Lord, I ain't even going to be able to get through all of these. It's, some people are engaged in improper execution. They, they were taught correctly, but they didn't execute correctly. So Christianity didn't work for them because they didn't work it properly. Then, then some people have unbiblical expectations. They, they expected things that weren't biblical. And they say, okay, I'm, giving my, my, I'm, I'm, I'm becoming a person of faith and giving myself to God. But uh, since I've done that, everything starts going crazy. This not working for me, so I'm leaving the faith. And I'm like, you're going to go through whether you got Jesus or not. <laughs> yeah, just leave, yeah, leaving, leaving Jesus is not going to make it easier. Some have, some have quit church because they recreated a religion and they called it Christianity, but they recreated their own version. They, they recreated a religion and they called it Christianity, but their Christianity doesn't require community. So they spiritualize their spiritual apathy and rebellion by saying stuff like, the church not a building. <laughs> when a lot of the scriptures that talk about one anothering are assuming you're a part of a spiritual family, that the commands on how you are even to relate to spiritual leadership doesn't mean you're supposed to submit to everyone who has a collar on, but it's assuming that you are clear based on, doesn't matter who you teach, who you listen to on YouTube, but it means that you're clear on who is the under shepherd God has assigned to help lead and to shepherd your life. I will give you, God says, pastors after my own heart that feed you with knowledge and understanding. And some people have created a religion that has created, called it Christianity, that has created a God that requires no commitment from them. They created a God that's okay being second. Because the God of the Bible has got to be first. But they create a religion with a God that's okay being second. And when you're dealing with people in group one, then the way we relate to them, listen to me, family, is by intercession, praying for divine intervention. But that's not the only group that's quit. There's another group that's quit. I'm calling them group two. And this group is quit because church has become a trigger for emotional trauma.
and they didn't give up on God or church. But because it's a trigger, it's hard to come to a place expecting healing when the place that's supposed to heal me broke me. You see that? All right, let me. Am I making sense? There are a group of people who are reeling from the emotional, spiritual, and relational trauma that happened to them in church. People have been casualties of harassment, molestation, manipulation, exploitation, been used until they're used up and thrown away. And for those people dealing with that type of pain, church has become a trigger. Women don't come to church to be told that your spiritual gifts only work in a back room. They are fighting gender inequality all day, trying to fight through glass ceilings, trying to get equal pay, trying to get equal opportunities, being told they're less than, not being taken seriously, people looking at their body instead of recognizing their talent. Lord. And when they have dealt with that all week long, they do not expect to come to God's house and to hear they are made in God's image and in God's likeness and have been deposited, have been invested. God has invested in them his gifts, his talents, his acquired skill, only for them to be relegated to the back room and using their gifts only on a certain group of people. See, I've been beat up all week. I don't come here to be told I'm less than two. Some of them are already struggling with esteem and, aware and, and worth and awareness, and the enemy's been trying to rob them of it since they were a little girl, and they're doing everything they can to believe what God says about them, and the place that's supposed to reinforce that belief cannot be the place that's stripping them of that belief. You got brothers who are underappreciated all week long, underappreciated all week long, emasculated, stereotyped, spoken to in condescending ways. You got fathers who hadn't even had a father, and they're doing the best they can with no example. And they're unappreciated at work, and they come home to unappreciative families. Sometimes they're dealing with unappreciative kids, kids mad at them when they don't even realize, first of all, you blessed if your daddy in the house. That's number one. Seven out of ten people don't have their daddy in the house in this area. Seven out of ten, daddy not even in the house. And you mad because yours making you clean your room? You need to be glad he cares enough to teach you discipline. I'm sorry, but it's going to be a long month. He teaches you discipline and responsibility. all week emasculated and then comes to a church if a pastor has not dealt with his emotional health issues then he gets affirmation for, from preaching and he doesn't preach from a place of affirmation and when you need it's hard to help people you need and when you need affirmation from the people you're preaching to you will preach things that garner you favor with them and so some of these areas that have been undealt with in a person's heart will cause a pastor uh, to emasculate men and to talk down to men to gain favor with the dominant population in Christian churches, which is women, who come the most, they serve the most, and they give the most. And so pastors start catering to that demographic because they know they can play and exploit on the emotions of women who not healed from their men issues. Oh, gosh. And they start bashing men and beating men down to get an emotional rise out of women. And the brothers are sitting in church like, why are you talking to me about them? I'm here. I'm not perfect, Rev, but at least I'm here. I'm trying.
you got millennials who say, I'm 17 years old. And you constructed a church that only worked for people that's 71. Y'all not talking to me. They're like, I don't want to wear that. My feet hurt. I don't wear Stacy Adams. I don't wear Johnston and Murphys. I don't wear Bostonians. The tie is choking me. I'm hot. I'm thirsty. You got some Gatorade and some water. I'm sitting out here with a dry mouth. You want me to be here all day? This is church, church. Sleepy man, sleepy man. Yeah, that's me. You're like, well, listen. It's like, you can't put nothing in church for me. You looking at me crazy if I rock, if they milly rock, if they do whatever. And you're like, you see, you need to grow up. No, you don't do that anymore because you're spiritual. You stop because you're older. You can't drop it like it hot. Your knees hurt. Wave at me if I'm preaching the truth. Let them leap, let them run, let them jump, let them lift their hands. At least they are praising God in here. So some people didn't quit church, they quit harassment. Some people didn't quit church, they quit games. Some people didn't quit church, they quit judgment. Some people didn't quit church, they quit irrelevance. They quit something that wasn't speaking to their Monday. They're trying to make dating decisions and school decisions and job decisions and, and parenting decisions. They got all of these things that they're dealing with on Monday that church never speaks to. And then we get upset when they listen to cultural voices that are actually speaking to it. You're not talking about it. And so although I understand the reason for people in this situation quitting, it's traumatic. I cannot condone or excuse the approach to the trauma. I, I'm, not, I'm not judging you. I just want to loving you, show you there's another way. Yeah. See, see, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, do not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So, so, so th th there's, another, there's, a, there's another way, but church, it begins with us putting the mirror up to our face and saying, okay, if we want people to quit quitting, are we willing to quit the things that make people quit? And I believe it is in this way that Jesus is, that this text in Matthew 21 speaks to us. Jesus, ladies and gentlemen, the inauguration of Jesus' ministry was the ending of another type. The Bible, the story of the Bible is divided up into two sections, Old Testament, New Testament. Old Testament is Old Covenant, New Testament is New Covenant, right? And so when Jesus inaugurates his ministry, Jesus ends one expression of relating to God as the people of God. They, they had sacrifices of bulls and goats and animals. And Jesus comes and says, after his death, burial, and resurrection, you can quit that. <laughs> 
Because you don't need bulls, goats, and animals anymore because I am your sacrifice. They were practicing one priestly system where you had to go to a man and tell, your, tell a man your issues. A man had to be a mediator between you and God. Jesus said, you can quit that now because I am your high priest that ever lives to make intercession for you. You don't have to go to man anymore. You can come to me. You can quit that kind of church. We must know what and when to quit. And in Matthew 21, Jesus comes into a temple and he sees something going on that disturbs him to the degree that he starts turning things over. The Bible says he sees money changers. What are those people? They were in the temple courts. And if you went in to make a sacrifice and you wanted to purchase something to sacrifice, you would have to take your money and give it to the money changers. The money changers would then give you temple money and you could use the temple money to purchase your sacrifice. But the money changers would do this. If you gave them $10 of your money, they would take the ten dollars of your money and give you five dollars of temple money and then they would take five dollars put it in their pocket and then they take the other five and put it in the temple so what they were doing was exploiting people and Jesus came in to a church that was exploitive and said stop exploiting people because you can exploit people economically throw a dollar in holler You can exploit people emotionally using guilt and shame and fear to motivate them. If you don't do this, you're going to die. <laughs> Y'all aren't talking to me. If you don't do this, you're going to die. You're going to die a horrible death. You're going to burn in hell, fire, and brimstone. By loving kindness have I drawn thee. Love is a better motivator than fear. He drove out the money changers that were buying money changers and watch this and drove out those who were buying and selling. What are we selling in church? You're not talking about t-shirts and juice boxes. What, what, what are we selling? Some of us selling, if you scream loud enough, God's going to turn your whole family around. And some of us need to stay, brother, I need you to study a little bit more than that. I ain't a theologian, but I need you to respect me enough to study. What are we selling? Are we selling you a Christianity that don't require work? Faith without works is dead. Are we trying to get you hooked and dependent on us so we become your weekly inspiration station so I can keep you coming back like a drug? I treat you like, a, like I'm a drug dealer, like you're an addict? Just keep coming back so I can give you fish instead of teaching you how to be a fisherman. All right, my time is up. What are we selling? And the Bible says that Jesus says these words, it is written, my house will be called the house of prayer, but you made it into a den of robbers. In other words, God says, it was my intention that church function one way, but I put it in your hands to steward it. And you have created something that is completely inconsistent with my intention. And what's scary is you don't know it because you like it. You like what you created, but it's not what I want. And some stuff we fuss about in church is stuff we like, but it's not what's written. You'd be amazed at things church fights over. Whether you wear white gloves with communion. We know what's been done, but we don't know what's written. So you created something that's completely inconsistent with my intention, and you confuse nickels and noses with my pleasure. 
So as long as people come in and give in, you call that success. It is written, but you have made it. We quit the church man-made so we can build the church Jesus made. Upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. And when verse 13 happens, verse 14 can happen. Verse 14 says, when Jesus cleaned the temple, then people came to him, the blind and the lame, and he healed them. People can't get healed until we quit some things that are getting in the way of their healing. I'm done. So as I close, I want to close with a prayer. I believe there are times God burdens my heart with what I need to pray for. Prayer doesn't notify God of a need. It expresses our dependency. It is partnership with him and what he wants to do. So when he wants to do a thing, there are times he will burden your heart to pray for what he wants to do. And I want to pray for verse 14 today. I want to pray for healing. But I want to pray for healing that you, I don't want to pray for healing from trauma that you got out the house. I want to pray for healing from trauma that you got in the house. And I want to tell you something. The church is not God. God is perfect. The church isn't. God never needs to apologize. As the church, sometimes we do. And it's, it's really scary how we tell you to do things we don't do. The church tell you, apologize, and then we don't. I started pastoring in my early 20s. That was good and bad. It was bad because I didn't have enough life experience to properly navigate some complex situations. So I made mistakes. Some of my mistakes hurt people. And I'm telling you this, not because I have to tell you this, I'm telling you this so that you know that everybody that injures you ain't evil. Sometimes they immature. Sometimes they in process just like you are. The only difference between you and them is that God called them to something different than you. And sometimes they call to something different that has a standard they got to grow into. It's just like you got to grow into yours. The only difference is depending on the platform you own, some people got to grow up in public. And you get to grow up in private. Man, I did some things. I always meant well, but I did some of I, I regret to this day. So I'm going I'm, to I'm pause. Uh, some of you, uh, you hadn't been underneath our ministry that long, but I'm going to pause, and I just want to do something. I want to stand proxy for, not just myself, but I want to stand proxy for just religious institutions, churches, Christian churches specifically. Man, I want to say I'm sorry. I don't know what church you came from. Maybe it's this one, but I don't know what church you came from. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that the place that should have healed you sometimes hurt you more. I'm sorry that we don't, that churches don't always appreciate you the way you should be appreciated. I'm sorry that churches sometimes unintentionally exploit people. They don't even try to. But they let them serve, 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 and never stop and say, but how you doing? Y'all not talking to me? Yeah, I see you at God's house every Sunday. Is everything all right in yours? Can I pray for you? Musicians who've been, who've been used but not fathered. Use your gift, but love your gift more than your life. And don't love you enough to say, man, how you doing? Not appreciating the sacrifice it takes for so many of you to be here. I'm sorry. 
I'm sorry, some stuff happened to some of you, you, you can't even tell. You and Jesus got to carry that to the grave. I'm sorry. The church will never be perfect, but it should not be dysfunctional. And so I want to pray for healing. And this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray for healing from actual and perceived offenses. Yeah. Because some people have actual offenses. Some people have perceived offenses. You think you were wrong, but you weren't. But the hurt is still real. <laughs> Even if you aren't right, the hurt is still real. Some people think you wronged them. You didn't wrong them. They did you wrong. They waiting on an apology from you. <laughs> You're like, wait a minute. So you mad at you mad at me? I'm sorry. But if we make a commitment to quit the church man made and to build the church Jesus made. It can be said of us as it was said of the early church, these are they that have turned the world upside down. Father, I pray now in Jesus' name, great God, the healer, go to the cracks and crevices of our heart where we have been wounded by a place we love so much and heal us deeply. Go to the deep places Unearth hidden hurt and meet us at the point of our need. I thank you for this. I ask this in the matchless, amazing name of Jesus. May we be healed by the wound in your side. In Jesus' name, amen. If it was tight but right, give God praise, everybody. Well, you can be seated today. You glad you came to church, everybody? Y'all praying for me this month? Yeah. I need prayer with this series, don't I? Yeah. I do. I need prayer. <laughs> Thank you. I need prayer. We're going to prepare to go. And um, before we go, we're going to worship God. We're going to worship with our giving, our tithe, our offering. Clap your hands, everybody. I thought you were on tour. You back? Huh? Back for a day? Yeah. He tours with Wiz Khalifa. Yeah. And all they talk about, all they talk about, his circle, all they talk about is when our guys go to tour, hang out or whatever, all they talk about is how he talk about this church. They're like, oh, y'all from that church. All he do is talk about that church. Yep. And that's, that's what kind of house this is. That's what God is going to do in this house and in your life. I'm telling you, that is prophetic. That is prophetic. That is a prophetic example of what God's going to do. He's going to use you to be a missionary to culture. He's going to shoot you into environments as agents of a subversive kingdom he is planting you as an undercover agent in a subversive kingdom they don't even know what hit them they, they're gonna think you're just an artist or a stylist or an engineer or a singer or an actor they don't even know you're an undercover agent God planted you there to be a light in darkness.
Did you hear me? Amen. How many, how many, see, faith takes personal possession of God's promises. How many receive that for your life? Well, family, thank you so much for watching this message. I hope it helped you change. That's what my ministry is all about. It's what I'm giving my life to. And there are only two things I'm going to ask you to do. As always, I'm going to ask you, number one, if this blessed you, I want to encourage you to share it, to email it, um, DM it, uh, text the link to someone else. Let someone know. Why? Because part of our mission is to help as many people as possible change their life. And I can't do that without your help. So that's the one thing I'm going to ask of you. Second thing I'm going to ask that you do is that you subscribe. And I want you to subscribe so that you know when we've actually put new content on this channel. There are times where we may not be able to meet our deadlines. And uh, sometimes I get messages and DMs about when is the message going up? Well, when you subscribe, that helps us keep you in the know about when we're putting new content out here. All right. Would you please, I'm going to add one more request. Pray for us. We need your prayers. We're trying to change as many lives as possible. And we know we can't do that without your prayer. Thank you for being a part of this online community and family. Take care. God bless.